Ah, yes, here we are. So, uh, so we have been uh, on a little series here that I'll introduce to you again very quickly as we move through. I've reminded you that for me, all theological things that uh, came to me even in high school, um, uh, as I as I came to the Lord and, and started experiencing Him, uh, have a practical significance to me. They're not just a religion to believe; they're principles to live by um, and uh, and transformative in my experience and. So so uh, it's always kind of where the rubber meets the road is what matters to me. All theological issues and questions to me, I want to know, well, how does that work out for normal people? <laughs> and so that's where I'm coming from all the time. The church, you know, focuses throughout the church year on the the uh, various uh, things that we need to remember. And so there's Advent that reminds us that the Messiah has come, Jesus came. It's Epiphany at the beginning of our, our calendar year that, that reminds us that he came because God loves the whole world and wants to save everyone, invites everyone to come to Christ, that the only way to do this was for Jesus to offer himself and die on the cross. We remember this during Lent, lead up to, lead up to Easter, and reflect also on the fact that life can be quite difficult and um, a struggle, and that there is a, a death part of being a human being. Um, and also, uh, we celebrate then Easter season from Easter right now, all the way through the end of May, beginning of June, depending on the year, where we, uh, where we, were, we shift over to Pentecost then. But we remember that Jesus not only died, but he rose from the dead. And we were forgiven, but not just forgiven, given new life. That we're new creatures in Christ. We've trusted Christ as our Lord and Savior. And so that's who that's where we are. We remember that. And the resurrection tells us that the cross was effective and um, and our sins were washed away. And so that's pretty cool. <laughs> and we remember that all the time. And then the rest of the year is Pentecost, where we remember that the Holy Spirit has been given, that God is always with us and He is transforming us and wants to transform the world through us. And so um, those things are all important, but we don't necessarily stay engaged with what matters. Jesus uses the picture of our eyes. He says, if your eyes are healthy, your whole body will be full of light. If your eyes are unhealthy, your whole body will be full of darkness. It's kind of the idea of a lens that everything we see is impacted by how we see it. And so when God wants to break through to us, it has to come through the filters that we put on it. And so it's important that we do the best we can to keep the filters clean, to keep the, the lens uh, clean. And so I like this picture because the whole idea of it is that you there's a sunset there, but you can't even tell it's a sunset um, without the lens that brings it into sharp focus. Um, you know, I had my, my glasses were dirty when I got in the car this one time this week, and I handed them over to Lou Ann and said, could you clean these? And then I couldn't read street signs. You know, <laughs> I had wonderful eyes until like my 40th birthday, and all of a sudden I started falling apart. But, um, but uh, and so they've been deteriorating for a while. But when I put those glasses on, I can see clearly. And, uh, and I've suggested that we need to take care of that vision. And one of the ways I suggest that we do it is to reflect on some things that are central truths. And so I every day, try every day to remember that I have nothing to prove, that I have nothing to lose, that I'm all, I, I want to be always thankful. I want to be always trusting God. I want to be always hopeful. I want to be always compassionate, and I want to be always engaged. And as I use those terms, I mean, I got nothing to prove. I don't have to be insecure because my I don't stand based on how wonderful I am. My standing is based on Jesus, on Christ, the solid rock I stand. And so I don't have to be um, insecure because in him, I find my security. Sometimes people might not be too happy with me. People may not like me, whatever problems come, but I know the Lord is always there. Nothing to lose. I know whom I have believed and believe, and I'm confident that he is able to keep what I've entrusted to him against that day. I don't need to be defensive and protective because everything I have has been given to me and um, I've received it from the Lord and I can trust that he knows what he's doing with all those things. Always thankful because joyful people are thankful people and thankful people are joyful people and that's where I want to live. And so I just have to stop for a little while. I'm sure it's true for most of us and look around and notice the many blessings that come to us through our friends, through our families, 
through the, the prosperity, whatever level of it is there is that God gives, through the joy that we can find in our hearts, that God is, is there and caring for us. And I want to focus on that and be thankful. I want to be trusting because I am not enough. <laughs> and so I want to lean upon the Lord and be confident of that. Today, just want to talk about always being hopeful. Um, mothers have to be hopeful <laughs> and stay hopeful at moments when they don't know what's going on. Um, but this isn't really a Mother's Day sermon. I'm continuing my series as we hit Mother's Day. Um, and so uh, today we'll just talk about hopefulness. Um, we, we grab hopefulness every year when we um, when we are uh, going through Advent, because hope is one of the things that we talk about and the hope that God gives us, but we're going to reflect on it again here for a few minutes as well. I've suggested this might be the mountain of your life that you're trying to climb, and I've just said that if you're going to get there, you got to be hopeful. You have to maintain a sense of hope, and what I want to talk about is how we're supposed to do that. How do you stay hopeful in this thoroughly messed up world? Where on one level, as we looked at through Lent, we looked at the fact that it's all pointless and hopeless. That's the way that things are. You're going to fall apart. You're going to die. All your friends are going to die. Everybody's falling apart. All the wonderful things you have are going to get old and rotten, and so are you and me. And so that that's, that's the, the hopelessness that you can encounter. But that is not where you want to live because that is not the whole story. And it doesn't work hopelessness does not work as a um, life focusing kind of truth or perspective. So here you go. Um, I'm going to give you some give you some verses and uh, and tell you how it is that we can be hopeful. The Lord Jesus in the upper room, he's about to be crucified the following day. These guys have been with him for three years and have been following him everything. And he has told them in the course of this time, that they're going to abandon him. He said that Peter's going to betray him. He's telling them all this in the upper room. He's telling them about all these problems. He says, you know, eventually people are going to kill you because they think they're doing God's a fate, God a favor. They're going to drag you here. They're going to drag you there. It's going to be tough. And then he says, I have told you these things so that in me, you may have peace. In this world, you will have trouble. But take heart. I have overcome the world. Now, before he got to this, he gave them the basis for this kind of a hope. He says to them, do not, in, in chapter 14, you remember this section, it's a pretty, pretty popular text. Do not let your hearts be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. My father's house has many rooms. If it were not so, I would have told you. I am going there to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come back and take you with, to be with me, that you may be where I am. He's got lots of promises of wonderful things that are going to happen. Um, but uh, in fact, that him coming back is called the blessed hope in Titus. The blessed, we're waiting for the blessed hope for when he will return and we will see him as he is and be transformed. Um, and, and he has lots of those kinds of things to say, but underlying all of it or, or, modifying all of it are always attached to the wonderful promises is the need to be able to expect to suffer. You are not going to be hopeful if you don't expect to suffer. If you think that when you follow Jesus, what that means is everything's going to go your way, you're going to have a crisis of faith before you get out of the gate, and it's just going to keep coming back on you. You need to expect to suffer. That doesn't mean we can't be hopeful. That's the reason that we want to be hopeful. But nevertheless, that's where it is. You get this all over. I'm just going to survey a couple of passages. Old Testament, there was often an emphasis on saying, do what you're supposed to do and God will bless you. And that's all true. But Ecclesiastes clarifies to it that, it's, that that's not really the whole story. It can be quite difficult. New Testament Almost all of the promises in the New Testament assume nothing about the positive nature of your circumstances. The New Testament, the whole message coming to us is that God's presence, peace, power, the Holy Spirit can transcend all those experiences. And even in the midst of difficult, all those circumstances, even in the midst of them, he can care for us. First Peter, he's, the, the Apostle Peter writes, dear friends, do not be surprised at the fiery ordeal that has come on you to test you, as though some strange thing were happening to you. But rejoice in as much as you participate in the sufferings of Christ, so that you may be overjoyed when his glory 
is revealed. Do you catch in that? Uh, where, he, where he goes in that is he says to us, don't be surprised. What the New Testament tells us to do is to normalize suffering. We have a tendency to catastrophize suffering. Something goes wrong, and we think it is the worst thing that could happen. That's not helpful. It's, it's because you, if your plan is you're not going to suffer, your faith crashes into the rocks of reality too quickly. And so here that he's saying, don't be surprised. Earlier on, he's told us, Peter tells us in the same book, his great mercy has given us a new birth into a living hope, that inheritance that can never perish, spoil, fade. It's kept in heaven for you. In all this, you rejoice, though now for a while, you may have had to suffer all kinds of trials. Therefore, with minds that are alert and fully sober, set your hope on the grace to be brought to you when Jesus Christ is revealed at his coming. Here, Peter grounds it all in what's coming. He says, don't lose hope. It doesn't matter what happens right now. Ultimately, you're going to be with him. And so he says, build on that hope. So he tells us, don't be surprised if things get hard. Jesus said, oh, you're only going to have trouble as long as you're in the world. That's what he says. Um, Second Corinthians, the apostle Paul says, do you, I do not want you to be uninformed. I just want you to catch. Paul's here doing the same thing Jesus did, the same thing Peter did. He says, don't be uninformed, you guys. Troubles, we experienced troubles. We're apostles, and we experienced troubles in Asia. We were under great pressure, far beyond our ability to endure, so we despaired even of life. But what I want you to catch there is he's saying, don't, he wants us to know that. He goes on to tell us how come it's okay, but this happened that we might not rely on ourselves, but on God who raised the dead. He's delivered us from a deadly peril. He will deliver us again on him. We have set our hope. Just one more example of this here, the apostle Paul in Romans 8, he expands it so that it isn't just an individual experience where he's talking to his disciples. It's not just Peter talking to the folks he was writing to. Um, it's not and saying, you know, you have had some struggles. It's not just like Paul did here where he said, we've been struggling. Here he says, oh, the whole, the whole planet is in struggle. That's, uh, that's, part of the, that's part of the picture. He wants us to remember that. Otherwise, our hope is in a false thing, and it will not su sustain us. That's why it's so important for our hope to be realistic. I consider that our present sufferings are not worth comparing the glory to the glory that will be revealed, for creation waits in eager expectation for the children of God to be revealed. For creation was subjected to frustration, not by its own choice, but by the will of the one who subjected it in hope that the creation itself will be liberated from its bondage to decay and brought into the freedom and glory of the children of God. Everything, even in nature, is messed up. God didn't initially intend to base the whole system on the weak ones getting eaten. That's how it comes. That's how it all results now. And he's saying, you know, creation is in pain for those reasons. Um, but one day it will be set free. We know the whole creation has been groaning as pains of childbirth right up to the present time. Not only so, we ourselves who have the first fruits of the spirit, we've come to Christ. We've experienced the joy. We have that peace that he gives. We've had all that. And we groan inwardly as we eagerly wait for our adoption to sonship, the redemption of our bodies. For in the hope we were saved, but hope that is seen is no hope at all. Who hopes for what they already have? But if we hope for what we do not yet have, we wait for it patiently. Hope in the scriptures isn't saying, oh, I hope, I hope, I hope. It's an I know so hope. It's the belief that the promise of God will occur. And so it is our hope. We wait for those things to come. All creation, our own bodies, everyone, is in the is it lives in a world where you got to expect to suffer you're going to have difficult people if you encounter difficult people that shouldn't surprise you of course you're going to in difficult people and of course most of the time it's you or me that are the difficult people the know-it-alls the gripers the yes people the passives the people everybody you're going to encounter difficult um agencies to deal with you're going to have financial struggles um, you're going to run into medical problems. There's no other way out of this place. And you're going to have car accidents and other things that go wrong that you don't want to have. And the political polarization 
it's nutty at the moment, in my opinion. I have to be careful not to comment too far. But um, the uh, but the uh, but the fact that there's political tension. Oh, it's only been that way whenever you've let people rule themselves. And um, and of course, there's going to be um, the, these are the times that try men's souls. This is true. Always spiritual struggle. It's part of being a human being. That's why Jesus said, I have told you these things so that in me you have, may have peace. In this world, you will have trouble, but take heart, I have overcome the world. The whole thing that I've said so far, just, just want you to see all those problems one more time as we go through them. It's a mess. It's the nature of the thing out there. That is not the whole story. But if you don't have that built into your understanding, then your hope is not going to make it because you believe in a false hope. The kind of hope that Jesus gives us says, well, first of all, let's get straight. Expect to suffer. It gets worse for a minute, then it gets better. Old Testament Psalm, I remain confident of this. I'll see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. Wait for the Lord. Be strong and take heart and wait for the Lord. Those things that are going to get better in this world, you're going to wait for them. That's how it is. <laughs> you're going to suffer and we're going to wait for it to be better. That those are things that are part of being human and especially part of following Jesus. That's why he said in Romans, you know, creation has been groaning, but we ourselves who have the first fruits grown, we wait eagerly in hope, hope, hopes, hope, but we wait for it patiently. We're waiting. Is there nothing in your life right now? I know there is that you're waiting for God to fix you're saying, God, can you somehow fix this? And he hasn't fixed it yet. Well, that's not unusual. That's the way this game is. Expect to suffer, plan to wait. You have to have these in place or you can't maintain any kind of hopefulness. If you're thinking, when I encounter suffering, that means God isn't taking care of me. When I kind of have some sort of problem and he hasn't solved it yet, I guess God doesn't love me. Um, I guess he's not going to give me what I need. It doesn't mean any of those things. <laughs> but, but if you go that way, you can't be hopeful. And if you can't be hopeful, ooh, it's a tough life. Do not forget this one thing, Second Peter says, dear friends. With the Lord, a day is like a thousand years, and a thousand years are like a day. The Lord is not slow keeping his promise, as some understand slowness. Instead, he is patient with you, not wanting anyone to perish but everyone to come to repentance. God is working out his plan and he will take as long as he needs to do it. And we have to trust him through it. But trust isn't our thing today. Today it's hope. We're gonna hang on to the hope, even though we know that we can expect to suffer and we can expect to wait. This is why you get these little warnings. Um, you know, it's, it's taking it on your computer when you're downloading something, and then it says, oh, it's taking a little longer uh, than expected, but we're getting there as fast as we can. This is because you're less likely to shoot your computer screen if they tell you you're going to have to wait. It's really irritating if you thought you had a reservation, and when you get to the restaurant, they say, oh, well, it'll be an hour. You don't like that. Because if we're expecting, what we expect manages or impacts how the things actually feel. It always takes longer than you expect. So these two, two struggling things, we're talking about hope, but the first two are, so. but that does not mean that we aren't supposed to expect suffering. That doesn't mean you live afraid of suffering, because he says he'll give you what you need when you need it. But when suffering comes, there's no reason for it to challenge our faith. We were warned. He told us that if you want a religion that tells you everything will go the way you want, just walk away from Jesus because he's not going to play that way. He is at work changing you, changing me, changing the world, and that will involve suffering and waiting. So I want to say, though, you got to prioritize a hopeful heart. You want to have a hopeful heart. If you don't have a hopeful heart, then you lose when you suffer. You become discouraged and hopeless while you wait. And so when you pay attention to your heart, or is your heart hopeful? Are you finding a way to trust God in the midst of the present struggle? If not, don't stay there. Talk to somebody that can listen to you and help you because you are supposed to be able to find a place of hope. 
the Lord promises you a place of hope. If you aren't in it at the moment, don't stay there. That's not the road you want to be on. I can remember when I, I'll say this in a minute. Uh, so in Ephesians, all I want you to catch here is, is um, he says that he says, you know, before you became a Christian, you were without hope and without God. But now in Christ, uh, you, you have hope. For, for in the New Testament view, the whole reason that you would be hopeless is because you don't know God and you don't have Jesus. If you, I don't mean that if you feel hopeless, that means you don't know God. That's not what I'm saying. I'm saying that he wants you to be in that place of hope. He wants you to be able to find a way to trust that tomorrow may be better. Um, and because that's what it means when you're a Christian, you're supposed to be given that hope. Um, he talks, it, I'm just going to fly through these because these aren't central to me wrapping up uh, the, or to getting to the point that I want to make sure I get, that he that um, he tells us there in verse 23 of, first of Colossians 1, that, that the whole thing of our walk with God is dependent on hanging on to our faith and staying in that place of hope. So it matters because it's the biggest gift you get when you become a Christian is the hope of those things that are going to come and of the confidence in the present that they will come. That's the whole thing that is sustaining in walking with Jesus, and also um, it's it's we're, we're, our whole faith and the whole thing rides on whether we can find that place. Last thought on this piece is that that uh, you know Psalm and Isaiah forty. I've spent a, a month preaching through this verse itself, where he says, "Those who hope in the Lord will renew their strength, soar on wings like eagles, run and not get weary, walk and not be faith faint." Pay attention. I'm suggesting to your sense of hope. When you are losing your sense of hope, you are in trouble. And you don't want to try to take care of that all by yourself. If you are feeling hopeless, you reach out for help. That's what you need to do. I can remember when our church was going through that big old conflict thing, and I was a real bad guy in some people's eyes. Um, that was a little tough for me because preachers don't like people to hate them. And um, and uh, and that was a difficult time. And there were points in that where I started feeling like, huh, I'm looking ahead and I'm feeling like it's pretty dark ahead. That's not what I usually feel like. And so I, I reached out to the therapist. <laughs> I, was in therapy. I went in there so somebody could say, oh, tell me, oh, the reason this is bothering you is because it's crazy. That was what he basically told me. But, but the, the thing I'm saying is you're not supposed to just endure hopelessness. Hopelessness left untreated, unpaid attention to makes you more hopeless. And that's not where God wants you to have to live. Please don't feel guilty when you're hopeless. Instead, view it as a spiritual fever. Uh, view it as a spiritual, you're barfing. You're now spiritually barfing. <laughs> Whatever you take to be that you say, I think I'm sick. You don't say, well, I feel badly that I'm sick. I'm just going to go crawl in a hole. Don't do that. You want to instead say, God, God, this is overpowering me. I need some help. Prioritize a hopeful heart. It's really important. Here we go. Let us, swerve un let us hold unswervingly to the hope we profess, for he who promised is faithful. Um, I just want to suggest that we want to um, expect to suffer we want to plan uh, to wait, and we want to prioritize a hopeful heart, and we want to build on bedrock. And um, there we build on the faithfulness of God. We want to trust that we can rely on God, not on ourselves. That's the place that it goes. Don't put your hope in yourself, because we each are just folks, and we need God, and we're going to have to trust in him. Put those, those uh, um uh, pylons or whatever they are, the things you pound into the ground, you, you got to pound it. You don't want to be like Highway 87. If you're not from up here, you don't know what that means. But Highway 87 is one bumpy road. And it doesn't matter what they do, it, it, it gets bumpy again, because it's built on a swamp. And so and so they can't find any any um, bedrock. They try to fix it, but it's always going to be a little mushy. And so uh, that's just the way it is. But you can't build your life that way. Your life has to go past all those circumstances. Um, as Peter said, he has given us birth into a new living hope. Um, hope, and the hope is, is trusting in the grace of Jesus. Jesus tells you, you know, I've told you it's going to be a mess. Trust in me. Drive the stakes down deeper. Live from a deeper place. Build on bedrock. I'm almost done. <clears throat> 
Jesus says, or the Jesus doesn't say this, Jeremiah says, I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you and not to harm you, plans to give you hope and a future. Trust in that. Trust that God knows what he is doing, even when we don't know what he was doing, and we can trust him, and trust in, in the, this kind of instance is hope. That's what it's about. We, we believe God's not done with me. It, it's not, human beings tend to think that the way it is is the way it's always going to be. And so when it's good, we think it's always going to be good. And when it turns difficult, then we think, oh, it's all pointless. It's hopeless. When it's difficult, we think, oh, it's always going to be difficult. I don't know what I'm going to do. But don't do that. Believe that God is at work and he's taken us somewhere. I'm almost done. This is my last point here. We're supposed to draw near to God. In Hebrews, it says right before that verse, hold unswavering, unswervingly to the hope we profess for he who promised is faithful. And then he says, this is where I'm going in this last point, let us consider how we may spur one another on toward love and good deeds, not giving up meeting together as some are in the habit of doing. And this is the point, but encouraging one another and all the more as you see the day approaching. Encouragement. I want to suggest that you want to employ encouragement. Employ it in the sense of reach out for it, and employ it in giving it to others, because everyone's heart needs to be encouraged, and hope grows when we feel encouraged by other people, and we all need it. You really can't follow Jesus. I mean, I know the songs. You got to walk that lonesome valley. You got to walk it by yourself. Nobody else can walk it for you. You got to walk it by yourself, and that's all true, but that's not the whole story. Nobody follows Jesus for very long, by themselves. <laughs> you just don't do that. You have to have somebody else that's speaking encouragement into your heart. Otherwise, you can't uh, hold on to it uh, too well. And so we want to hold unswervingly to the hope we profess. We're going to need some encouragement. I grew up in Seattle. I was a Boy Scout, an Eagle Scout, am an Eagle Scout, once an Eagle, always an Eagle. Um, and uh, I, most of my camping, if it wasn't in the middle of the summer, and even then, was in the rain. And so they taught us to be careful with hypothermia. Hypothermia exposure. If you get wet and you get cold, once your temperature drops below, I think it's about 88, you can't warm yourself up. It might be lower or higher than that. You can't warm yourself up. You know what's going to happen? You're going to die. And that's what's going to happen if your temperature gets too low unless someone else warms you up. That's how it works. They would tell you, you got to get in a sleeping bag with somebody else and let them snuggle with you because you got to get warm. That was a, a pretty funny idea to a couple of Boy Scouts. But nevertheless, the, um, you, had, you had to snuggle because you couldn't get warm on your own. I never got hypothermia. Hallelujah. But, the, but if you are, you can spiritually, your temperature can get so low, you can't pull yourself out. You and the spirit aren't going to do it. You need somebody else. You need some encouragement. One way to keep that encouragement is to stay connected to people who will encourage you, support system. I mean, in that time when I was crashing, um, the, the thing that helped me was a therapist, but it wasn't just a therapist. I also, I maintained connections with other pastors that I go to with whatever's going on. I stayed in direction. So I was talking to people about what I was feeling. Um, there were other people that could help me. I can remember going to one retreat. Some of you might know, uh, Sherwood, might remember Sherwood Carthen. He was a huge African-American pastor from Sacramento. And I remember going to one retreat that he was at and him laying his big old hand on my back and praying for me like I was Jeremiah or something. And that really lifted me. It was really helpful. It sort of infused some hope um, in, in a time of, of uh, struggle. And uh, that's you, you can't do it um, on your own. We need others to help us hope when we can't. A final poem, and then I'm about ready to wrap. Sorry, moms, I'm stealing a few minutes from your lunchtime here, but let me let, lend me your hope for a while. I seem to have mislaid mine. Lost and hopeless feelings accompany me daily. Pain and confusion are mine companions, my companions. I know not where to turn. Looking ahead, the future time, this, I, I didn't type this, I, I copied it, but they apparently messed up the number here and there. Looking ahead to the future, um, does not bring forth images of 
to future times. I can't read. Looking for ahead to future times does not bring forth images of renewed hope. I see troubled times, pain-filled days, and more tragedy. Lend me your hope for a while. I seem to have mislaid mine. Hold my hand and hug me. Listen to all my ramblings. Recovery seems so far distant. Lend me your hope for a while. I seem to have mislaid mine. Stand by me. Offer me your presence, your heart, your love. Acknowledge my pain. It is so real and ever-present. I am overwhelmed with sad and conflicting thoughts. Lend me your hope for a while. A time will come when I will heal and I will share my renewal, hope and love with others. I wanna suggest that if you're feeling any of those kind of feelings, reach out to somebody. You can always reach out to me. <clears throat> I'm, I'm, a, I'm a pretty good listener and, um, and I don't tell anybody else what you tell me. And so, so you can always reach out to me, but reach out to somebody if you're feeling that because your hope is really important and you want to find it restored. And everybody else, know that there's somebody around you who's feeling some of those things. There's somebody around you that might need some hope. I can't remember if I left this funny little quote in here. No, I didn't. I took it out. It was, it was a quote about the fragility of human beings and how, but it wasn't right on topic. So I didn't use it, I guess. But the was it's just to remind us that, that, that everybody around us needs to be encouraged. Um, that it's, you know, it's like we, it's the opposite of the home on the range where, where seldom is heard an encouraging word, <laughs> you know, um, you just need, need the touch from somebody else encouraging. So let me just make us all aware of that because hope is central. You can't sustain it on your own. You need a support system and a willingness to reach out when you can feel it slipping. And uh, you want to always, particularly as a church, we want this to be a hopeful place for folks. So I'm wrapping up. Vision care, nothing to prove. You don't have to prove your security. You're trusted in Jesus. Nothing to lose because you can trust him with all things. Always thankful because he so greatly blesses us. Always trusting because the Lord is reliable and can be trusted. Always hopeful because we have the Lord who has plans that he has made for us. And he is at work in us. And we want to pay attention to that and do our best to remember to be hopeful and to get some help when we're having trouble finding a way to do that. Let's pray. Father, we thank you that you give us cause to hope, that for us, hope is not some kind of a mental game. It's simply dealing with reality. You've done wonderful things for us, and you've given us great promises for the future. And so if we can live in line with what we believe is real, if we can lean into that, then we can be hopeful people. But Lord, sometimes we get uh, knocked over and get distracted by the circumstances, by the, the struggle, by the uncertainty, by, by the woundedness that we can feel. And, and so Lord, I just pray for each one of us that you would protect us from, um, from trying to go it alone. You would help us to reach out to one another <clears throat> and to be sensitive to one another uh, so that we uh, can be a hopeful church a group of hopeful folks, and that each one of us can find the hope that we need to carry us through difficulties that are certain to come. We thank you for your, uh, your, your kindness to us, your presence, and, and all that you give us. In Jesus' name, amen.